Okay, here we go, and uh, part three of our lecture on attribution theory. Uh, and you'll have to bear with me because uh, my allergies and hay fever are really playing up with me. And so it's, I <laughs> need to cough every so often. So uh, let's get back to uh, attribution theory and the major outline. So uh, as I said before, uh, Heider originally developed the idea of attribution theory. Uh, then he left to do something else. Uh, Kelly came up with his attribution theory or theory of attribution. And then something interesting happened. Uh, Edward E. Jones uh, came up with his theory of correspondent inferences. And, uh, you know, it's another attribution theory based on Hyder. But why correspondent inferences? Uh, you know, this theory is frankly bad. It uh, is difficult to work with. Kelly's theory, very easy uh, to work with, has been very popular. Correspondent uh, inference theory uh, was not very popular from the beginning, and frankly, we would have forgotten about it a long time ago, if not for one surprise. And this is one of those uh, truly special uh, times in science where researchers uh, actually are surprised uh, by their data and find more than they really expected to find. And it's a very interesting story and a very important story. So a little bit of the timeline about how things were going. Uh, in 1965, Jones and Davis uh, developed the theory of correspondent inferences. And then uh, three years later, uh, Jones and one of his graduate students, Victor Harris, uh, was, uh, you know, they were uh, conducting an experiment to test predictions of their theory. And the tests of the predictions of their theory didn't work out. But what they found was something that they called the correspondent bias. And uh, this was, as I said before, an accidental discovery. So what they call, what this correspondent bias was, is the tendency to explain others' actions as stemming from dispositions, even in the presence of clear situational causes, the tendency, of the, uh, the tendency to overestimate the impact of dispositional factors. Now I want you to think about that uh, for a minute. Uh, it's a tendency, so it, you know, it's something that people prefer to do. Uh, to explain other actions, or that's just another word for another set of words for attribution. Uh, so other people's actions, let's clear this up. Other people's actions, I still don't, this is, there we go. I can click on pen, but I have to click twice. It's very odd. Uh, so we're going to explain other people's actions as dispositional, that is, internal attributions, even in the presence of clear situational causes. That is, even when we have information to make an external attribution, we are going to be biased to make a dispositional attribution or an internal attribution. And it's a tendency to overestimate the impact of these dispositional factors. That is, we, when we uh, observe somebody behaving and want to make an attribution, what happens is we give more credit or more impact to the dispositional causes, the internal causes uh, for that behavior than external causes. And as I said before, Jones and Davis, or Jones and Harris, excuse me, called this the correspondent bias. However, you're going to hear me, and the textbook is going to call it the fundamental attribution error, or the FAE. Uh, the way this happened was that while Jones felt that correspondent bias was a very appropriate name, uh, West Coast uh, social psychologist Lee Ross wrote a review chapter about attributional errors. And after going through his list of attributional errors, he comes to, well, this is probably the biggest attributional error, let's call it the fundamental attribution error. And that name stuck 
uh, Jones hated it and Jones uh, worked on the East Coast and so he made sure that all of his graduate students and anybody he could terrorize on the East Coast called it the correspondent bias. However, this name stuck for the Midwest and the West Coast. And so uh, since I went to graduate school in Ohio, uh, I call it the fundamental attribution error. Let's say a couple words about uh, Edward Ellison Jones. Uh, back in 1992, he won a very prestigious award uh, in social psychology. And when Mark Schneider was presenting the award to him, he said that he has truly been a leader in social psychology. Wherever Ned goes, social psychology follows. And of course, the next year he died. And I thought that was kind of a you know, dark joke. But anyway, uh, he was Ned to his friends which I was not. Uh, he started out uh, teaching at Duke University and then went on to Princeton. Uh, and uh, when asked how he would sum up uh, his career, he said he was interested in how do people form impressions of each other, uh, how uh, do they uh, control the impressions that other for others forms about them. And uh, the areas that he did research in to become such a famous social psychologist, the correspondent bias, even that by itself uh, would have placed him in the top five social psychologists of all time. Research on self-handicapping, uh, that is how we try to, when we're afraid we're going to fail at something, we will try to muddy the attributional waters to make it difficult for other people to make uh, internal attributions for this upcoming failure. Social stigma, uh, and again, just by his work on stigma, uh, it, you know, by itself, uh, he would be unbelievably famous. Uh, and strategic self-presentation, that is, the, tip, the type of strategies that people use uh, to present themselves to other people in the best possible light. And, uh, you know, he shaped the methodology and epistemology for social psychology for years to come. Methodology is, of course, the different types of research methods that we use. And epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge or the uh, scientific uh, uh, philosophy of knowledge, how we go about thinking about knowledge and obtaining knowledge. So he really affected how social psychologists do their work for up until probably today. So he was a phenomenal character. Uh, Ned uh, was not a very friendly person. Uh, he uh, developed uh, rivalries and uh, uh, very, very easily. And uh, one of my, my professors in graduate school was one of his enemies. At one time, he was one of his friends and then became, uh, over a minor slight, one of his enemies. And because of that, I was on his you know, S list also uh, and knew to steer clear of him at conferences. And unfortunately, one of my uh, colleagues, an, another graduate student, uh, introduced herself to Ned. And the minute he found out, where she, you know, where she was studying, he just like looked at her and turned around and walked away. So let's uh, talk about the experiment, and this is uh, probably one of the top experiments in social psychology of the 20th century. So first off, and again, here we get into methodology and epistemology. This was a questionnaire study, and students have the hardest time understanding this. So. Take a second to wrap your minds around this. The entire study was in a questionnaire booklet given to a participant. So you're a participant in this study. Nothing happens to you except you're given a booklet to read, and then at the end of the booklet you circle some numbers. That's the experiment to you, the real subject. Now there's going to be, I'm going to explain a lot of stuff about this student and that student and the reader. And, okay, remember, None of those people exist. Basically, all we have is a uh, participant, a psychology 
a student in the research pool sitting down someplace uh, reading a booklet and reading a story and then responding to the story by circling numbers. And that is what I mean by methodology and epistemology. And I'll get to that uh, in a later slide. Uh, so the questionnaire began by describing a poli-sci class at a nearby university. And they actually described the student they're going to be talking about. This poli-sci class never existed. They just made it up, but it sounded very reasonable. In this class, the professor assigned a question, an exam question to his students, uh, which required the students to write about Castro and Cuba. And the class had been uh, talking about them, uh, you know, uh, before the exam. And need to stop for a second. Castro and Cuba, uh, at that time, 1967, Castro was seen as a immediate threat to America by almost all Americans. Uh, we had gone through the Bay of Pigs uh, invasion, which was a CIA-backed invasion of Cuba, which failed. Uh, then there was uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the world almost blew itself up because of Cuba and the Russian nuclear missiles. Uh, that were uh, you know housed in Cuba, so uh, this is you know Castro was a universally despised figure or feared figure in America, and you have to understand that to understand why they chose Castro and what's going on in the experiment. So, poli sci class talking about Cuba, of course they would be because that's poli sci at the at the time. After this page, the questionnaire started to differ. That is, there were four conditions in the experiment, and based on the conditions, you would get one of four different questionnaires. One group of participants received a questionnaire which described a specific student. They named him RS. They gave him his initials as RS, who was assigned by the professor to write either supporting or against Castro. Depending upon the condition of the experiment, the participants were told that RS was either assigned to write supporting Castro or assigned to write against Castro. Uh, the second group of participants received a questionnaire which uh, said that RS was allowed to choose which side he wanted to write on, either supporting Castro or against Castro, and RS chose a side either supporting or against. After that, the questionnaire booklet contained a copy of the student essay exam, RS's answer. RS wrote a B plus, uh, A minus answer to the question and always obeyed the assi assigned side given to him or the side that he chose. So if he was assigned to write pro Castro, and think about that for a minute, you're assigned to write an uh, essay supporting this horrible person. Well, that's what people back then uh, believed. Uh, so that's what is going on in this story. And remember, it's a story about R.S. who doesn't really exist. So he's a blank. Finally, the participants were asked to rate R.S.'s true attitude towards Castro on 10 1 to 7 scales. All right, so let's see how well you're doing with experiments. What are the two levels of the independent variable? And what are their levels? Each uh, variable has two levels. What was the independent variable and how was it operationalized? And of course, you can go back and look at the earlier slides by uh, rewinding the video. All right, so uh, hopefully you got this. IV1, we could call that level of constraint. That's what uh, Jones and Harris called it. And the levels were assigned versus choose. So uh, the uh, subjects were either assigned to write pro or against Castro, or they were given the choice to write pro or against Castro. So one independent variable, IV1 here, uh, is assigned versus choice. IV2 is essay position and that's pro versus con. 
uh, for Castro or against Castro. And so this is a factorial experiment that I've been talking about. That is, we have two independent variables which are crossed. And so this first condition here uh, has subjects who are assigned to write a pro essay, or actually uh, RS is assigned to write a pro essay. Even I make that mistake. Choice. RS is given the choice and he chooses to write a pro essay. Assigned. RS is assigned by the professor to write an anti-Castro essay. And choice. RS is get, uh, given the choice and he chooses, chooses, chooses to write against Castro. Uh, and of course the dependent variable was RS's true attitude and it was operationalized by the 10 1 to 7 scales that the subjects filled out. Uh, so uh, they had different uh, you know, scales such as how much do you support Castro, how do, much do you think Castro is doing a good job with Cuba, uh, is Cuba uh, you know, a friend of America, and uh, you know, they just added up those 10 scales so you could have a score from 10 to 70. 70 being totally in favor of Castro and Cuba, 10 being totally against it. Okay, so let's slow down a second and maybe stop the video and think about this and review, but uh, if you were the real subject and you were faced with this question, okay, RS is that dude in the, in the story and he was asked to write an essay for an exam so he's going to get graded uh, and you found out the grade he got. Uh, so what do you think his real attitude towards Castro is? Now, pretty much you're in the same boat as the real subjects in the experiment. You're reading about RS or you're hearing about RS and uh, now you're asked to make an attribution about RS. So uh, choice when RS is given the choice and he chooses to write a pro essay, what does that tell you about RS's true attitude about Castro? When he's given the choice and he chooses to write against Castro, what does that tell you about his true attitude about Castro? Uh, usually these are pretty obvious. But now, uh, what happens here in the sign? Uh, he's assigned to write an anti-Castro essay. So what do you think his real attitude is? Well, you know, he's writing against Castro and everybody in America is against Castro, but it was assigned. So he was given free choice, so how would you know how to fill in this box? Likewise here, this is even more difficult, uh, he was given uh, a pro direction to write on. It was assigned it for a grade. Uh, everybody in America really dislikes Castro. He writes this essay positive about Castro, so how would you answer here? Here are the actual results from Jones and Harris's study. So uh, we have the scale going from 10 to 70 and for a good scale, you, a good graph, you should always include the zero point uh, so people know uh, the proportions of the scale. And uh, the way this works out is we usually put one independent variable here and then the lines are the other independent variable. And so that's what we have. Red is against. So uh, if you were uh, if your essay direction was against, it's red. If your essay direction was in favor, it's blue. And here are the two levels for uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, constraint. You were assigned, that is you were ordered to write against or in favor. Or you were given the choice to write against or in favor and you chose against or in favor. And as I said uh, in the last slide, here, 
it's easy to figure out how to answer. If you're uh, asked to write, uh, you know, uh, you know about Castro and you choose anti-Castro, well, that must be because you feel that way personally. So it would seem pretty, uh, you know, obvious that you would want to give them a low score indicating that they're anti. Castro. And again, if they choose to write for Castro from their own free choice, you would want to give them a pro rating that they're pro Castro in Cuba. So that makes a lot of sense. But then here, this is more problematic because if they're answering, you know, well, no, they're, they're not, you know, because RS is being assigned to write against Castro. So you don't know what RS's true attitude is, so why are you even answering at all? And even here we see that we don't know what his true attitude is. You know, we, we don't know anything about what he thinks. We know he's been assigned to write a pro essay. And people attribute his attitude up here. And hopefully, you can see how erroneous this is. That is, a lot of students say, well, maybe you should just refuse to answer these. And in fact, in other experiments, people have been given the choice of refusing, and they just don't. So that doesn't work. Or another uh, option is that you split the difference. Uh, so what should happen is you should have something that looks like this. But that doesn't happen. We have something which looks like this. So this gap here, that makes sense because people are just choosing, people are just uh, making attributions based on the choice that the person made. But here, people are making attributions based on the orders that were given to RS. And so, as I said before, this is no problem, this distan distance here. Uh, pe people are using the target's free choice to diagnose their real attitudes. But this difference here, that is the fundamental attribution error. Subjects are using a target's constrained behavior to diagnose real attitudes. So, RS's behavior is constrained so we're using forced behavior to indicate, to you know, allow us to make attributions of what RS really believes when it's forced. He, he doesn't have any choice. So as I said before, if the two lines would meet here under assigned, then there would be no fundamental attribution error. But the problem is those two lines don't meet. So we have this thing called the fundamental attribution error. Uh, now, we'll talk about a lot about this uh, later on in this lecture, but also in uh, the uh, synchronous class. But let's just go back and look at uh, what I said before about how this shaped methodology and epistemology for social psych for years to come. Uh, when we evaluate experiments, one thing that we use to evaluate experiments is the rubric of ecological validity. And, uh, you know, ecological validity is the degree to which the methods of the experiment are natural or true to life. And uh, I ask in person, is Jones and Harris's method natural? No, it's not. Whenever are we given stories to read about a person and then asked to circle numbers to indicate how we feel about them? So in terms of ecological validity, this experiment lacks a whole lot of ecological validity. It's really down there at the bottom of the scale. It's a very fake artificial experiment. In fact, we use three uh, rubrics to evaluate experiments, mostly internal validity, external validity, and ecological validity. 
I've spoken about internal validity before and the textbook has. Uh, only the independent variables changing between conditions and so this means that the experiment is confound free. Uh, internally valid experiments uh, you're able to assess the relationship between the IV and the DV very clearly. Uh, and Jones's experiment rates very highly on internal validity. Because it's done in the laboratory, because it's done in a pencil and paper setting, Jones is controlling all of the information the subjects get and he's limiting the type of answers or responses the subjects can give and that type of control reduces the possibility of confounds and ensures us that only the independent variables are changing between the conditions. So we know that the independent uh, variables of uh, essay direction and constraint level are affecting the dependent variable that is the ratings of the uh, RS's true attitude. Then also we can talk about ecological validity. Uh, that's not really important here, but it's how well the results can be generalized to other frames. And frames mean time, settings, and people. And the way that we uh, go about uh, having good external validity in an experiment is to include examples e.g. for examples, that's a period, uh, to, we, exclude, we include examples of different times, settings, and people, different types of people, in one experiment. And then we can generalize those results to different, uh, excuse me, uh, different uh, frames, different uh, time settings and people. And I may talk about that in the synchronous class. And then we've already talked about uh, ecological validity. So this is what I mean by, you know, and using Jones and Harris as an example, uh, the way that Jones affected methodology and epistemology and social psychology. You'll notice that a lot of social psychological studies are these questionnaire studies or these pencil and paper studies. That is, these pencil and paper studies are easy to do they have relatively good internal validity, but they have relatively poor ecological validity. And so the question is, we're measuring behavior in an artificial situation. Is that real behavior or are we just measuring artificial behavior? And that's the question that we have to ask when we have poor ecological validity. Uh, so uh, we have good internal validity, so we know that the IVs are causing changes in the DV, but is that a real behavior or are we looking at something that's just been created in the lab and will only exist in the lab? And even in other social psychological experiments that are not pencil and paper based, uh, they'll be in a laboratory and they'll be in a very controlled setting and we have the same problems. It's in a laboratory, a very controlled setting, so we have good internal validity, but a laboratory is an artificial situation, and so therefore we have poor ecological validity. Uh, so, uh, ask a couple questions of you to sum this up. Uh, ecological validity, is Jones and Harris's method ecologically valid? Well, I've already kind of answered that. Uh, and then also, what behavior is Jones and Harris measuring? Uh, this is a question about ecological validity. Uh, circling numbers on a page. Uh, well, that's pretty much an attitude. And in a couple of weeks when we talk about attitudes, I'll return to this question. Do our attitudes reflect our behavior? And uh, so this question we'll have to put off for a couple weeks, but keep that in mind. Do our attitudes really reflect our behavior? That is, if we have an attitude about something, will we behave in a way that's uh, similar to our attitude? And then finally, let me take a sip of uh, latte. Uh, let's talk about the fundamental attribution era itself again as a postmortem. 
So uh, the fundamental attribution error became one of the most important ideas and experiments in social psychology. Uh, and it really is a doozy, it, you know, uh, for a couple different reasons. First off, it's a robust uh, phenomenon. By a robust phenomena, I mean that we can do it in any situation and it shows up. And in, when I was doing this class live, I would do a demonstration in class of the fundamental attribution error and every semester for the past 20 years it all was worked out because the fundamental attribution error is always that strong. And I've never had that level of luck with other uh, demonstrations in class because the effects that is the strength of different phenomena I talk about in this class are not nearly as strong as the fundamental attribution error. Uh, so this is a very uh, you know, ubiquitous, that it means everywhere, and pervasive and strong phenomena. Uh, and in the synchronous class, we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, so uh, a lot of research has been conducted about the fundamental attribution error. And uh, you know, we found out that one reason why it's so robust and pervasive is that it's not caused by just one thing, but it's caused by probably several different things. Uh, the first cause is probably that perceivers expect the actors to leak out their true attitudes. That is, you could say to yourself, well, you know, if I was in RS's position and I was forced to write in favor of, uh, you know, in favor of uh, Castro, I would just do a bad job. Okay, but you know, they didn't. The, the, the quality of the uh, you know, uh, assigned pro essay was just the same as all the others. And so based on that, people will have the assumption that they expect the uh, you know, actor to leak out their true attitude. They expect RS to write a bad essay and when he does not write a bad essay, they say, well, see, he probably really does believe in it. Because if he didn't believe in what he's writing about, he'd do a bad job, or uh, he would, uh, you know, uh, do something to kind of let us know. And the problem is that happens all the time, and nobody notices. Uh, for example, back during the Vietnam War, uh, you know, the uh, French film crew was going to go to the Hanoi Hilton, which was a notorious uh, North Vietnamese prison uh, for American POWs. Uh, American POWs were abused, mistreated, and tortured uh, in the Hanoi Hilton. But when the film crew came, they gave the prisoners new clean uh, uniforms, and they fed them, and they did everything to make them happy. And they told the prisoners, if you don't uh, you know, uh, show that you're happy with us after the film crew is gone, we're going to beat the shit out of you. And so the prisoners felt like, well, we really can't do anything. But then at one point, the uh, North Vietm Vietnamese wanted to uh, you know, uh, show how m happy the American prisoners were. So they forced the head POW to give them a bow of thanks. Uh, at, you know, for the film crew. Uh, so the head POW, you know, didn't want to do it, and they said, well, we're going to beat you, and we're going to beat your men. So he said, okay, I'll do it. However, when he did it, he over-exaggerated the traditional Oriental bow of thanks and actually stuck his hands back up backwards to show people that he was being forced. He was trying to leak out his true attitudes. And so when finally he was released and got back to America said, did you see it? Did you see it? And people said, what? Did you see I was trying to let you know that I didn't really want to thank my, my captors? What? What are you talking about? Go back, look at the film. You see how I do a fake bow? Oh, we never noticed that. Again, another example of this, uh, during the Iranian, uh, P, uh, the Iranian uh, embassy uh, you know, hostage situation, uh, you know, the American uh, embassy staff was held hostage for about a year, and then they were finally released. And when they got back to America, 
the uh, ambassador said, did you see it? Did you see it? And people were like, what? Well, the, the ambassador had to read several statements on video uh, that were prepared for him. Uh, however, while he was reading the statements, he was blinking out torture in Morse code with his eyes. Now, I can't think of a better example of leaking out your true attitude, but people didn't notice it. And uh, so RS could have like misspelled things or could have given bad uh, examples. And in fact, when actors do this in the essay paradigm, perceivers don't notice it. So in both the, par the essay paradigm and in real life, people don't notice this. Uh, there's a Gestalt psychology view. Gestalt talks about unit or figure or whole form. Uh, that is the closing, closure and whole formness. And so the Gestalt psychologists say that the action, writing the essay, and the actor, that is the actor's attitude, they form a Gestalt, a perceptual unit. So if the action is pro-Castro, the actor has to be pro-Castro also because they are equivalent in your mind because they're part of one Gestalt. Uh, the Western culture explanation. Uh, the fundamental attribution error is a little bit more stronger in Western cultures or in individualistic cultures. Individualistic cultures are cultures you, we have here in America, Canada, England, uh, and Northern Europe, uh, where they prize and uh, you know, encourage people to be separate individuals from others. And in collectivist cultures, uh, such as India, China, uh, you know, uh, uh, Western Europe, and uh, I mean Eastern Europe and uh, South America, uh, these collectivist cultures encourage uh, you know a communal or a group-based uh, identity. And in Western cultures, which have this individualistic focus on identity, uh, which highlights personal responsibility for behavior, it just makes more sense that if people are being held personally responsible for their behavior, if they say they're pro-Castro, uh, then they must be pro-Castro. And then finally, uh, perceptual salience. Uh, salience means to stick out. And we've long known that uh, the most salient, that is the most obvious or the most sticking out thing in a situation, we will tend to see as the cause of things happening in that situation. And when you have a person uh, in a room, for example, everything in the room is static, and the person is talking, and the person is moving around, and the person is doing things, the person is salient. And so because the person is salient, they're seen as more of a cause than things in the situation that are just sitting there. And if you think about it, this is the explanation between, behind the actor-observer effect. And you may want to think about that. So the fundamental attribution error caused by several different things. All right, and one final uh, post-mortem. Uh, I said before that it was mainly location and who, where you went to graduate school uh, that we use the term fundamental attribution error or correspondent bias. We've done so much work on this phenomena that we've been able to actually tease out a difference between those terms. The fundamental attribution error that is an error is basically more or less our tendency to make dispositional rather than situational explanations for a behavior. Excuse me. Uh, that is, we erroneously make dispositional attributions when we should make situational attributions, or we erroneously make internal attributions when we should be making external attributions. And the correspondent bias is when we ha uh, have a tendency to draw correspondent different uh, dispositional inferences from behavior 
that is when we are focusing more and more on looking at the similarity or the connection uh, between the behavior and the person's internal state. So when we when it's more due to the fact that we're trying to connect up uh, what's going on inside the person with what's going outside, that's a correspondent bias. But the fundamental attribution error, the error is that we erroneously use internal attributions when we should when we have the information to make a situational attribution. Okay, and so uh, that's it for attribution. Uh, we'll have some interesting things to talk about uh, in class, in our synchronous class this week. Bye-bye.